Yeah. Hi, everybody. My name is Mac Ebert, and I'm the lead author and I of the Showerhead Microbiome Study, and I'm here with Terry Webster and Noah Fear. Hello. Um, and we're hopefully going to give you guys a little bit of insight into the data we collected over the last couple of years, and hopefully answer a couple of questions about the paper um, and about anything science and or showerhead related you may have um, either as a participant or as somebody new to the study. So the format for the webinar is we're going to kind of briefly talk here, and then we're going to go through a PowerPoint that will address some topics um, either from the paper or kind of broad ecology of showerheads. And then we're going to hopefully take some questions that were either submitted earlier or are being submitted live as we um, broadcast. So a little brief background into this. This is a study that was started by Noah Fear and Rob Dunn um, back in 2016. So it was a citizen science initiative that allowed people to submit um, swabs from their shower head and then they were able to um, they would be able to get data later from us based on what we found and looking at overall communities of shower heads and you know, studying the bacteria that lived in um, residential plumbing. So we have a very brief um, PowerPoint we're going to go to. So I'm going to attempt to share the screen here and hopefully we can um, talk a bit and give a bit of insight onto the um, Showerhead project. Yeah. Is that, can you guys see anything? Yeah. Oh. Cool. So we're going to give everybody a, a quick update. And within that update, um, we're going to hopefully talk a little bit about bacterial diversity in the showerheads kind of geographic distribution of bacteria, and then kind of touch on potential impacts of hu on human health. Um, so, let's see. And first and foremost, we want to thank all the participants who sent in a swab. I know many of you sent in a swab in, you know, September, October of 2016. So we appreciate your patience and we appreciate all the questions that have come in over the last couple of years. They've all been extremely insightful and hopefully we were able to answer as many as possible. But um, if we haven't, now is a good opportunity to kind of reach out and um, ask us your questions. So for those who haven't heard from us in a long time or those who didn't participate in the study, what we did is we collected swabs from showerheads across the U.S. in a couple of locations in Europe. And in the end, which I think was May 2017, was our cutoff for sample collection, we ended up with 640 U.S. samples and 53 European samples. And you can see we ended up with a good mixture of municipal samples and well samples. So this is, these are samples that are either your shower head was fed through municipal water or well water. And again, if for individuals who didn't participate in the shower head microbiome project or submit a sample, just a quick overview, what we did was we sent out these sampling kits. And within each of the sampling kits, there was a pair of gloves to ensure sterility when sample collecting, a swab to collect the biofilm from the inside of your shower head, and then a questionnaire and a protocol. And then participants would receive this kit, sample their shower head with the swab, and then using the very basic chemistry kit that was included within the, the sampling kits, they could um, record very basic water chemistry that was coming from the water coming out of their shower head and then send the sample back to us for uh, microbial analysis. So many of you who participated would have received the link to this interactive map. Um, so I've taken a screenshot of the map 
it looks a lot like the map of where the samples came from. So everyone who submitted a sample, and as long as that sample had enough um, biological material on it to um, collect data for us, um, their uh, showerhead point would have ended up on this map. So what participants are able to do is scroll over all of these points using their anonymized ID and see which one uh, is their showerhead and look at how their showerhead compares to showerheads in uh, you know, New York or California or you know, Maine or Portland or any of the, uh, any of the surrounding areas or uh, 49 of the 50 states. So if you scroll over an individual showerhead, you would have received a little um, pop-up like this. So what this is doing is explaining to you what percentage of the um, bacteria in your showerhead was made up of individual species. So I know a lot of questions came up about the other category, which I've highlighted here. So in this particular showerhead in Denver, you have 60% um, as Acinetobacter but and 12% as Blastomonas, but you have 24.88% other. So what this means is that of the top 25 taxa we found in each of the shower heads, um, it means you had you had bacterial species that did not fall within that top 25 taxa, so they were categorized on the interactive map as other. So what I have up now is the map of the top 25 bacterial taxa that were found in uh, residential showerheads. So what we have on the y-axis is abundance, so that's the percent abundance um, on a log scale of the bacteria in your showerhead, and on the x-axis we have the genus of the bacteria. So you'll notice, you'll notice when you would, would have scrolled over your um, sample point, you may have seen some of these that are coming up in the top 25 taxa. Unfortunately, there were thousands of taxa, so we could only represent the top 25. So that other doesn't mean you have a new or novel species it means that that percentage did not fall in the top 25 taxa, so it kind of fell in this other category. Um, some of you may have 90% other, meaning the bacteria in your showerhead didn't fall in the um, top 25, and some of you may have you know, 1% other, meaning that 99% um, of your bacteria fell within the top 25 most abundant. So. One thing I do want to highlight is that a lot of these bacteria we found were just very common um, tap water associated bacteria. Um, and another thing to notice is there's a lot of variability um, in these bacterial taxa. So from zero to 99% abundance in certain shower heads, which is very interesting because you can see how much variation there is in. Um, in the bacteria that we each have in our shower heads. So again, to kind of backtrack and remind people kind of what we did, uh, we collected information on both water chemistry and geographic location, um, among other variables for each of the shower head samples. So we collected location data, so lat long data, hardness data, alkalinity, pH, nitrate and nitrite, iron, free total chlorine, and then a little bit of information about the water source. Was it a municipal water source, a well water source, or other? And then a little bit of information on cleaning frequency, and then shower head type. So one of the questions we had, and one of the questions that kind of began to pop up as we were looking at the data is what is potentially driving this geographic variation, um, and is it the result of human interaction with our environment? So the data we have up on the screen right now is based on the participant data. Um, so 
as participants um, were recording their water chemistry, they were filling out a questionnaire and that data was sent back to us where we compiled everything and matched the water chemistry data up with the biological data from their showerhead. So just kind of an interesting um, pattern we saw here is it looks like total chlorine and free chlorine is much higher in the US than it is in Europe. And pH seems to be higher in Europe than in the US and total iron is also higher in the US than it is in Europe. So I'm gonna pass the um, presentation over to Tara Webster right now and she's gonna talk a bit about the overall community. Um, and by that, I mean all the bacteria that are living in the biofilm in your showerhead. Thanks, Matt. Um, so, yeah, here we're showing, you know, all the data that we collected and we tried to look at to see if any of these water chemistry variables or uh, information about the showerhead could predict uh, or explain the variation that we saw in the overall bacterial communities. And in most cases, uh, or overall, when we look at the data, the strongest, um, the most significant descriptor of the differences in the microbial communities is the water source. So this is whether the water was coming from municipal source water or well water. And I just wanted to give a brief overview of, you know, what might be different about the municipal versus well water. So here is just a schematic. In most cases, well water is coming from a groundwater source and receives very little treatment before uh, it reaches your tap. Um, however, in a municipal water treatment system, there are many steps uh, taken from the water source. It might be groundwater, it could be surface water, or it could be a combination of those water sources. And uh, then that water is usually chemicals are added to uh, coagulate and settle out particles. And then there's often multiple filtration steps through either sand or activated carbon uh, before disinfection. And disinfection uh, at the treatment plant can include UV and ozone, as well as in the US, a chemical, either chlorine or monochloramine is added before that water leaves the, the treatment plant. So as you can see, there uh, is a great difference in terms of how this water is treated, whether it's municipal water or well water. And we then see this difference in our microbial communities when we look at the overall bacteria. Um, and we have a significant effect of this treatment. Um, we can see from just the measured values of uh, total chlorine that, as we would expect, municipal water systems had greater, on average, on average greater levels of total chlorine compared to well water systems. And so then this slide is showing uh, the bacteria that are differentially abundant in municipal water versus well water. So on, on the left here are, oh, I don't know. okay. Um, anything to the left of zero is our bacterial groups that were more abundant in municipal water. And then everything to the right are bacterial groups that are more abundant in well water shower heads. Um, and a few things to notice is that a lot of these bacteria that were more abundant in well water are unclassified. Overall, uh, we found a little less than half of the bacteria, about around half of the bacteria have, um, are previously uncharacterized or have not been grown in the lab. So this kind of speaks to the great diversity of bacteria we're capturing in this uh, sampling and um, we're hoping to be able to learn more about these bacteria through these samples. Um, a lot of them are really typical water bacteria including sphing sphingobium, sphingomonas, um, aquabacterium. Um, and so some a little more detail about some of these groups. Um, methylobacterium which was more abundant in showerheads um, 
receiving municipal water. His, actually, this is a picture of it in a Petri plate. It has a pink pigmentation, which is one way that bacteria can respond to stressors in their environment. It can degrade simple carbon compounds and is found in a variety of soil, water, and human environments. And then another group, aquabacterium, here is uh, some images from uh, looking at how it colonizes um, different pipe material. Aquabacterium is a very good biofilm former. And you can see, so this is the top images um, at an early time point, and then um, the bottom images after colonization that this bacterium can really grow on on pipe walls um, and it's also commonly found in water distribution systems and soils and even some species in this group are even capable of oil degradation and so, so, oh yeah. so we're hopefully now um, that we've kind of touched on the community um, differences we're going to kind of focus in on the most abundant bacteria that was found in the shower heads, and that's mycobacterium. And one thing to notice about the mycobacterium is that there's a tremendous amount of variability in abundance. So some shower heads had almost 99, 100% mycobacterium, and some had zero. So there's a you know, something is causing these large discrepancies in um, mycobacterial numbers. So I know many people have asked us, and a lot of people have this question, well, what exactly are mycobacteria? And I don't want to go into a tremendous amount of detail here, but a couple interesting facts is that they're kind of a unique uh, stress-tolerant bacteria. They have a unique cell wall. Um, that's kind of waxy and makes it resistant to chemical agents like chlorine um, and then ozone. Um, they're very good at surviving in extreme conditions. And I know a lot of people don't think of their shower head as being an extreme environment. But if you think about these periods of your shower head drying out and you think about the possible low nutrients and you think of it um, having to, having these bacteria having to deal with periods of high water flow and no water flow. Um, and they're great at surviving um, in these kind of adverse conditions. And as Tara was saying, um, with the methylobacterium, they also have um, kind of distinct pigmentation that protects them from kind of environmental stressors, um, like chlorine and their, um, uh, like I mentioned earlier, one of the important factors here is that chlorine, they're, they're not susceptible to chlorine like many other bacteria are. So mycobacterium can come from numerous different sources. Um, in this case, we looked at premise plumbing and, and uh, how that relates to the shower head and the biofilm in the shower head. But mycobacterium is also a common inhabitant of just soil and water. You can find it, you know, anywhere from, you know, lakes to cranberry bogs to estuaries. Um, it's also an inhabitant of dust, and it can be found in hot tubs. Um, but like we did in the study, we're going to focus in a little bit more on the showerhead. So, in the showerhead. I guess mycobacterium is a, you know, very large genus that consists of, you know, over 150 species. Um, and two of those are probably very familiar to the wide audience, those being tuberculosis caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis and leprosy caused by mycobacterium leprae. But what a lot of people don't know is within um, the genus mycobacteria, there are you know, over 150 more species. And what I've highlighted here um, are the handful that have been known to act as pathogens in people who are um, immunocompromised. And while there are this handful of pathogens in here, um, 
There are also a great number that are not pathogenic um, or, and have never been shown to be pathogens um, and are just environmental existing mycobacteria. So what we have here is a tree, a phylogenetic tree that kind of shows relatedness between mycobacterial species. So you can kind of think of it as a family tree. Um, and you notice there are a handful uh, that may be pathogenic, but there are a large number that aren't. Um, and another question that comes up and another one that um, is of interest to a lot of people, both clinically and in um, kind of uh, medicine today, is what is non-tuberculous mycobacterial disease? So it's very briefly, it's an opportunistic infection of the respiratory tract and or the skin. Um, there is an increasing prevalence, but that's poorly understood. The mechanism of that is currently poorly understood. Um, but um, I think we're kind of beginning to understand routes of exposure and hopefully are able to begin to uncover kind of what is leading this increase in pulmonary and cutaneous infection. And another interesting fact about uh, NTM lung disease is that um, it, is, it seems to be variable geographically. So with all the information we were able to obtain from the participants, we were kind of able to look at um, like, where mycobac uh, species of mycobacteria were found geographically. Um, and as was shown previously by Jenna Jemian's group, who is also a co-author co on this paper, that there seems to be a geographic trend in um, prevalence of lung disease. So, we kind of stepped back and said, you know, we have all this information on species and we have all this mycobacterial information, you know, what can we, can we use this water chemistry to um, data that we've collected from the participants to say something about um, geographic relative abundance of mycobacteria. So one cool fact we saw was that there appears to be a effect of municipal versus well water, much like Tara had seen with the um, different bacterial species we saw in the shower heads um, and amounts of chlorine, the pattern seems to persist as well with mycobacteria. So municipal water receiving more chlorine seems to have a higher abundance of mycobacteria than well water. Um, and chlorine concentrations can be greater than 10 times higher in homes on municipal water than well. And if you remember back to the slide where we talked a bit about mycobacteria in general, um, you'll remember that their kind of waxy coating makes them resistant to uh, chemical agents like chlorine. So it's possible that mycobacterium are less susceptible to chlorination than um, other bacteria are. And another interesting kind of fact we noticed during this was that mycobacteria are less abundant in European showerheads. So this could also be due to chlorination practices. And I know Tara had wanted to talk a little bit about kind of European um, plumbing versus plumbing in the US and treatment practices. Sure, yeah. So in, in Europe, the treatment to, in many countries in Europe, the way that drinking water is treated is really different from the strategies used in the US. There's uh, in many places they don't chlorine, they don't add any chlorine or chloramine to the water before they send it out in the distribution system. And there's much greater focus on reducing the total amount of carbon that's in the system so that basically it reduces the amount of food for bacteria in the distribution system. Instead of adding a chemical to prevent bacterial growth, they try to prevent it by keeping all the things that bacteria might need to live out of the water. Um, but in the US, our, we have a history of uh, adding chlorine or chloramine, um, and there have been a lot of you know 
public health benefits in terms of reduction of other diseases. Um, but I think these results and others show that there may be some uh, unintended consequences in terms of um, selecting for certain uh, bacterial groups with those treatment strategies. Um, yeah. So the figure that's coming up um, is kind of looking at the top, um, we have top 25 here, um, mycobacterial species that we saw in showerheads across the uh, United States and Europe. Um, this is a graph or a figure, I suppose, of percent occupancy. So that means this is the number of samples that this certain species was found. So for example, M. gordone, um, the top one was found in almost 100% of samples. And uh, Mycobacterium gordone is interesting because it's um, very inert, almost never um, seen in, in clinical cases. And it's almost considered a contaminant in uh, research experiments. So people are very, People don't really consider it a, a pathogen at all, um, but it's a very common inhabitant of soil and water and showerheads. So, um, but you'll also notice on here, I've put arrows pointing to potentially pathogenic um, mycobacterium. And it's good to remember that um, these are potentially pathogenic to those with a uh, compromised immune system. Um, so, you'll see that there's a handful of them, but there are also a number on here that do not cause um, respiratory or skin disease um, and actually have, you know, other interesting, you know, roles in ecosystems and, you know, are found in different places and seem like they share some interesting geographic um, patterns, but they're fairly innocuous to our health. And then kind of moving away from the, the bar chart, we have a map um, looking at the more pathogenic species. Um, so that is the M. avium complex, uh, M. abscessus group, and then the M. mucogenicum focacum um, group. So what's interesting about this is you can see there are regions where there are higher abundances percent of that mycobacterium um, per sample in different geographic locations. So if we look at the M. avium complex, the right side is kind of the reddish, orangish being a, like the higher abundance and the dark blue being you know, almost zero to no abundance. Um, you'll see that there's distinct geographic patterns for these mycobacterial groups. So it looks, so Southern California, um, Florida, uh, the New England area seem to have higher abundance of mycobacterium avium than say Colorado or the kind of the West. Um, and the same goes with mycobacterium abscessus where it looks like Florida has a higher percentage of mycobacterium abscessus compared to, you know, basically Colorado and anything over to the, the West. Um, and the same goes for mucogenicum. You can see these areas or hotspots of higher abundances of a certain mycobacterium species compared to other regions of the United States. Um, and what I've done is brought back the um, kind of the clinical uh, incidence map that Jenna Jemian created in 2012, looking at areas of higher risk for or higher reporting risk for certain mycobacterial species, and it looks like incidence of um, mycobacterial um, lung disease kind of overlay with areas where we saw higher percentages of these pathogenic mycobacterium. That being said, it doesn't necessarily mean that the showerhead is causing these, um, these trends. Because we, we don't know if the species that you're seeing in your showerhead is the same that they're seeing clinically. Um, so it's, it's an interesting kind of ecological survey to see, you know, are there geographic trends in the species mycobacterium 
um, her gene is mycobacterium, and is there is there individual are there trends in the species within mycobacterium avium obsessus mucogenicum um, that are geographic? Um, so again, if we don't need to worry too much um, about this this correlation, but it is it's interesting um, to see that there is a little bit of overlap between what they've seen with clinical data and what we're seeing with our abundance data. And again, it's it's NTM disease um, is is you know it, the susceptible populations are those with you know, compromised immune system. Um, so it's kind of interesting to see where the, uh, where kind of the geographic patterns fall. And to kind of end the PowerPoint on a more uplifting note, um, there has been research done on a single strain of mycobacterium over the last 20 years, showing that there may be benefits to mycobacterial exposure. So, Dr. Chris Lowry has shown that um, you will see he has seen an increase in immunoregulation and a decrease in inflammation, allergies and asthma, anxiety disorders, and depressive symptoms. Um, so while you know so there are pathogenic groups and there are numerous just kind of inert um, mycobacterium that are just existing kind of around us, there are also potentially beneficial mycobacterium. And with that, I want to thank kind of everybody who's been uh, kind of an important player in this. Noah Fear from C Boulder, who's here with us today. Rob Dunn, uh, Jen Honda, who's at National Jewish, um, as well as Ed Chan at National Jewish, Christopher Lowry, and Manu, who was formerly at the University of Colorado. And again, we want to thank everybody from C Boulder. Noah, uh, Jessica Henley, Angela, Tara Webster, who's also here with us today, um, Jen at the National Institutes of Health, Rob Dunn, for, and especially Lauren for um, helping get this webinar going and with all her, basically, her help from the very beginning of the study, um, and then National Jewish for their important role in kind of everything we've done. So thanks, Lauren. So I'm going to go back to the live stream and we can answer any questions as they're coming in. We have a few that were submitted um, before the webinar and if any are trickling in as we go, we're happy to answer them now. So you should be able to submit a question on the, um, the showerhead page that um, we can see that. So if you have any questions for us in Boulder, I'm here again with Tara and Noah. Um, and we're happy to answer any showerhead related questions or kind of general elite ecology of your showerhead. Um, and we'll address a few that came up prior to us starting the webinar. So I guess we can start with the... Yeah, maybe I'll kick it off. So Noah Fear here. Um, and one question that came up uh, repeatedly in some of the questions emailed to us in advance was, should I clean my shower head? Um, and I can't speak for Tara or Matt, but I don't clean my shower head. Um, and yeah, so, so it's a good question. And I would guess I would say just to sort of recap what Matt has already focused on. Yes. You know, we do detect these mycobacteria and shower heads. Some of them are pathogens. Some are probably harmless. Some may even be beneficial. And there also appears to be differences depending on where you live and where your water comes from in terms of the likelihood that you have these pathogens in your shower head. But the last thing we want to do is for people to be paranoid about taking a shower. Um, so, and, and the fact of the matter is, is, you know, the disease is on the rise caused by these mycobacteria. And we've shown, as well as other people have shown, that the breathing in these bacteria from the shower heads may be an important mode of transmission. But we also don't want to make people fearful of taking the shower heads because the disease is relatively rare. And if you're immunocompromised, um, it can be really problematic. But if you're a healthy individual, you've been taking showers for presumably many years and, and you're 
and you're fine. You haven't gotten any infections. So, so I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about it to summarize. Yeah. Touch on that one. So another question oh, um, that we had come in earlier was related to the different disinfectants used in the U.S., so chlorine versus chloramine. There have been a few studies that showed that chloramine um, had greater abundance of mycobacterium, but some of these studies were actually pretty limited in scope. They had about 70 samples. and. Actually, most of them were from um, buildings, not actual homes or, or shower heads. Um, and while it is true that uh, mycobacterium um, can you know, use different nitrogen sources, which are part of um, monochloramine, um, other research has really shown that mycobacterium is very good at surviving um, chlorine and monochloramine. And so, um, this work plus others recent in recent studies have shown that there isn't necessarily a, a great difference between the different disinfectants and mycobacterium abundance. Um, one other question that came in, and we will get to the question that was posted on the on the live chat. But uh, one other question that came up was, you know, when you the the maps, the interactive maps that were released, you can start seeing which, what bacteria are found in your shower head. Um, many of the shower heads, you have a large percentage of other taxa, which we recognize is not very informative. Um, and so the reason they get put into this other category, well, there's really two reasons, is one is we had enormous diversity. So in a given shower head, you can have hundreds of different bacteria. Um, and I think that's really important to recognize that this is a, Although it's a tough place to live, you know, strong variations in temperature, you oftentimes have chlorine, you have high water flow, there's not a lot for microbes to eat. It's a stressful place for microbes to live. But despite that, in nearly all the shower heads we looked at, we have a fairly high amount of bacterial diversity in there. And so the reason we have to use the other is because, you know, the list of all the potential bacteria that could be found in your shower head would be hundreds of tacks along. So we sort of collapse that down into other. And also, some of the taxa we can't put a name on. Uh, so we know they're there, we can detect them by the DNA sequencing approaches, but we don't necessarily know, oh, they fall into this genus or they have this species name. So those, some of those may actually just fall out as other. We got a great question um, from the chat. Uh, asking to explain a little bit more about this less food in the distribution system practice that happens in Europe. So, um, in historically, in there are places in Europe that have used like uh, sand filtration and um, other biological treatments for their water supply, um, and in these cases, they're really trying to get all of the microbial activity happening at the treatment plant so that the water that leaves the plant has very little um, carbon or nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus that the bacteria could grow on. Um, it also includes looking upstream before the plant and trying to get water sources that have very little carbon or nutrients to begin with. Um, and while this has been a practice in, the, in Europe for a long time, it is, it, it, and the US has taken a slightly different approach there are still a lot, a lot of focus in the U.S. looking at how to reduce carbon in effluent water um, for a variety of reasons, microbial and chemically as well. Um, we want to remove that from our um, water before it goes through the distribution system. Um, however, due to our historical treatment practices, it's not necessarily something that uh, U.S. treatment plants could just stop adding a disinfectant um, just based on the age and condition of the pipes that uh, that service our water. We really need that disinfectant to be there in order to keep the water safe before it, it predominantly safe for um, most people drinking tap water. What, just one thing I want to add on to Tara's response is I think it's important to recognize that um, Chlorine is incredibly useful from a public health perspective. Um, 
you know, there used to be a lot of communicable or a lot of diseases we would get from drinking water. And in most places in the United States, you don't have to worry too much about having a glass of tap water and worrying that you're going to come down with diarrhea a few hours later. Um, so I think it's, a, yeah, it's just important to recognize that it is a very uh, useful practice. And especially historically, it's been a, a huge um, public health benefit. But I think what our research on the mycobacteria in particular has shown, as well as other bacteria, is that there may be unintended consequences of adding the chlorine, where it is shaping the communities, and it's particular taxa that um, increase or, or decrease in abundance in response to the chlorine treatment. Do you have any other questions that were submitted prior? Oh, one question was posted about how important is shower temperature? And that's a great question. And it's something we'd really like to be able to figure out. The problem is, is we didn't actually collect data on temperature in the shower heads. And also it's very hard data to collect. And the reason is, is because, um, you know, what may be important is the temperature of your hot water heater, uh, which, which, we obviously can't get that data. And even for people in your, even if you live in your home, it's hard to get that information on what the specific temperature is of your hot water heater. And also what may matter is not necessarily the temperature of the hot water, but the average temperature that your shower head experiences over time. And that's of course gonna be related to a number of factors, how hot you like your showers, how often you use your showers and so forth. So I think it's a great question. It's something we'd really love to dive into, but right now we don't really have the data um, to specifically address that question. Can we say more about pH and iron influences? Mm. Yeah, so we're getting a we got a question um, through the chat about pH and iron um, and how that is different between here and Europe. I think it's a great question, and yeah, whether this is due to limestone um, specifically in the Great Lakes. There's a lot of factors that influence the, the pH of the water that's coming out of your shower head, including the treatment practice. So it's partially the source water and then also um, through the treatment practice, um, actually a lot of times chemicals are added to change the pH to ensure um, good downstream removal of particles and um, other contaminants. So uh, that is a great question in terms of how it's linked to um, the geology of regions that isn't something that we've specifically looked at um, but I hope that these geographic uh, the explanation the results that we see geographically um, could indicate some of that because we got we have very good geographic spread of samples um, and we did have a handful of samples that would vary you know drastically in pH um, so hopefully with a little bit more, of digging and looking at um, the microbacteria community or the overall um, bacterial community in general, we can kind of take these these regions and maybe focus on them um, that have kind of a more extreme pH. Um, they, you know, I know water source in Florida is very different than it's going to be in in other states in the U.S. So um, there's kind of a there's a good opportunity in there to you know take the data we've collected and hopefully, you know, either focus in on something or look a bit deeper in our data. Mm -hmm. And we do, though I don't have a lot of the details, we do see that pH is also a significant, um, we, a significant variable in terms of the overall microbial community. So as we would expect with that source water and treatment difference, <coughs> what pH water you have in your shower head does influence the bacteria that are there. And that's, and that's very much a finding that's in line with lots of other work. We, as well as many other people have done in other systems. So for example, in streams, oftentimes what bacteria you see in streams is strongly determined by the pH, whether it's more acidic, more basic, same in soil, uh, same in, in, in other environments. So um, long story short, you know, there, there's likely, if it's not just chlorine, it's not just source water, um, it's also pH is gonna be important in structure in the community. And oftentimes those factors are correlated with one another. And in terms of mycobacteria, especially in the environment, they tend to favor a lower pH. So um, 
I mean, looking forward beyond kind of what we've looked at in the showerhead, there's um, kind of data that says, that, oh, maybe mycobacteria will prefer a lower pH compared to a higher pH. So um, there's the, the data is definitely out there, but we have, we're, you know, we're kind of hopefully looking in that direction next. So one question that just came in, which is a very good one, which is, will we be doing more of this project? And if so, um, just to paraphrase, um, how would it how would it be different? And that's a great question because um, you know now that we we know thanks to all of those who volunteered to collect the samples from their homes, uh, we couldn't have done this project without all the volunteers. Um, but now the question is, is okay based on what we found here, what's the what's the next step? Um, I don't think we would necessarily just do the same project again um, and it's always better it's always great to have more samples but I think at this point we sort of know enough from the sample and be done to, to design more maybe more perhaps more targeted experiments or get to some of these questions about the importance of temperature and other factors that weren't measured or were just plain difficult to measure um, so it might be I, I'm not sure is, is the short answer um, I mean, there's lots of questions. I mean, like any scientific project, you find out some things, you gain some new knowledge of a system, but you also realize how little you know and all these new questions arise. Um, so I'm being vague in my response because I'm not sure exactly what that would be. But I think one thing that is very interesting is to investigate in more detail, perhaps the public health relevance of these exposures to bacteria from breathing in shower water as you're taking a shower. And again, it's not necessarily just um, relevance as potential pathogens, but some of these bacteria, including some of the mycobacteria, may actually be beneficial um, to human health. And so disentangling that, it's not trivial, but that would be, it is definitely um, of interest to us as well as many others. Hopefully we were able to clear them. I know we got a lot of questions on the other, and we're just kind of scrolling through the ones that came through via email. Um, so again, if you, the other doesn't necessarily mean um, it's, you know, a mysterious new taxa or something we've, um, something we couldn't put a name on. It just means it, we could only focus on a small top 25 uh, bacterial taxa, but you know, your showerhead may have contained hundreds more um, that couldn't be represented easily um, and kind of transmitted to the participants. Again, if you have any more questions, type them out. Um, I think hopefully we've addressed everything that's been sent our way thus far. Um, just glancing over the, again, the email, the questions that came in through email. Um, I mean, one thing I'll just add is, you know, we're not done with the project here. We still have a number of uh, papers that are coming out um, and other analyses we're doing on these samples. And so as those come out, we'll, we'll make sure that all the participants or anyone who's interested um, um, sees sort of what, what we've done with all those samples that were collected. And then we have a question of where kind of we'd like to go from here. Um, I don't know, I kind of touched on that. Um, and hopefully, like you said, we're not done with the with the project. You, you know, it didn't end on in May of a couple of years ago with the you know the sample collection. We're still hopefully continuing to explore these. Um, a lot of the questions that were coming in, we're still continuing to look at. Um, and I, go ahead. Yeah, one question I think was related a little bit to how these results are being communicated to the to the broader fields of interest, both health, public health, and then also, um, you know, environmental engineering for your water treatment plant operators. And so there, 
these results are being shared through conferences and through the papers, um, but to a really broad range of community from community scientists to, um, to you know, more specific um, technical uh, water works uh, related um, operators and utility managers. And there's a lot of interest in the you know the the engineering community you know how do you how do you design um humidifiers and medical equipment and you know house you know pipe systems that you know, residential piping systems that maybe don't promote bacterial growth or like there's, there's a hope to understand where these results fit in the you know the broader you know i guess the broader field of engineering and science because Tara was saying there are people beyond um, kind of microbiologists who are interested in kind of the communities that live in residential homes. So um, hopefully we were saying through conferences and through the um, manuscripts coming out and, um, you know, through everybody's participation in this, we kind of been able to spread, um, you know, the interest in in biofilms and bacteria that live in the house and in residential plumbing and kind of better understanding what, you know, our impact on um, our water and how our water treatment practices affect the, you know, the ecology and the microbiology. In terms of the question of, in terms of the question about future research, one thing that, that would be quite interesting to do is one thing we don't have any data on is sort of the time it takes for this colonization to occur. Um, like, so, and which also, again, relates to the cleaning question. Like, do these communities form in days, weeks, months, years? We're not sure. And undoubtedly, the timing of how long it takes for the communities to get established is going to vary depending on water chemistry, on temperature, on, on a number of other factors, how many microbes are coming in to the piping in the first place. Um, so there's, that's something that we haven't looked at. Um, we couldn't do it with the design of this study, but it is something we could look at in the future is sort of the colonization and, and maybe recovery after disturbance after you clean or disturb, otherwise disturb a showerhead community. We, we did get a good question about, you know, how long has something been in the showerhead? You know, is it something that could have been there for, you know, you know, before you moved in or could have been living there, um, you know, a hundred years before you moved in. Um, I think it's unlikely that, you know, your biofilm is existing in its original form from a hundred years ago. But um, that being said, on a smaller scale, we don't necessarily know what the turnover rate for the bacteria is in your shower head. Um, because what we have is a very um, kind of a very static picture, I suppose is the right word, of the the community. We don't, you know, we're not looking at these um, kind of like dynamic changes over a period of time. We have a snapshot of what your shower head looked at looked like on, you know, maybe October first, two thousand sixteen. So. Um, we can't say too much about, you know, going back to the cleaning question and back to what Noah said about, you know, what it would look like and how quickly it would repopulate and, you know, is something that was living there 25 years ago, 30 years ago, you know, being becoming a problem now. So I think this whole time of, um, especially if you buy, you know, and the question that comes up is if I buy a new shower head, uh, you know, is it is there a threat there? So I think this whole time of colonization and what colonizes is still very, um, you know, kind of up in the air, and we're still addressing that. But like we had said, it's hard from the kind of the static picture we took of these thousand shower heads, you know, to get that kind of information. So if anybody has any last questions, um, definitely feel free to post them. I think we've addressed as much as we could from the email and from the people submitting questions. And if anybody has any other questions, um, feel free to email yourwildlife at gmail.com. I know this uh, 
broadcast will exist on YouTube. So if there's anything you missed or if you missed the beginning or if you'd like to watch the slideshow again, um, it will exist for, um, I suppose, eternity now. Um, so uh, definitely feel free to ask any questions. Um, we're happy to answer them. Lauren at NC State is happy to answer them. Um, and hopefully if you are watching this later or you know miss the opportunity to submit a question right now, we can um, we can hopefully catch up with you at a later date. And again, thank you to everybody who participated. And if we've missed any emails over the last couple of years, we apologize. Um, there's been a lot of lot of questions have been coming in. And we've been trying our hardest to answer as many um, and as accurately as possible. So there's still a lot of unknowns and there's still a lot of questions we have. Um, so hopefully over the next you know a little while as we kind of dig deeper into this and more manuscripts come out and we you know kind of look at different aspects of water chemistry and other variables, we can give you a better answer um, if yours wasn't answered to your liking today. So I want to again thank Tara Webster and Noah Fear. Um, and I want to thank Lauren um, Nichols at NC State for getting all this set up for us. She's been instrumental since day one. And then I want to thank Rob as well, wherever he is in the world right now. Um, so again, if you have any questions, um, feel free to pass them our way. And then um, thanks for listening. Uh, and again, thank you for participating in the Showerhead Microbiome Project.